Good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm betting probably your teenagers know our company better than a lot of you in this room. And like um, video games are, are a great aspect of the school environment and college environments and at home. And sometimes you're upset at the kids for playing, but myself personally, every minute they put in the playing games means something to us. And like, I have been with Valve for almost 15 years now. Um, actually, I came to Valve to actually start building uh, the Steam platform. Um, back then, um, the idea was, originally of Steam, the idea was to actually replace FTP downloads. What would happen is multiplayer games such as Counter-Strike, our own Counter-Strike game, or Half-Life Deathmatch or something like that would need to put an update out. And when you would talk about a million players out there needing this content all at once, they'd have to all go out and reach to FTP sites. So we'd go out there and we'd see the FTP sites, and then immediately they'd all crash. And like, so, we, so at that time, Valve felt there's got to be a better solution for delivering content to gamers for these updates than to actually use FTP sites. And, like, and it'd be better if it was dynamic. So at that time, we brought in and we started working on a pro started working on the project that at one time was codenamed Grid, codenamed Gazelle, and eventually became what we call Steam today. Um, in 2003, we released the first Steam client. It was an update for Counter Strike uh, 1.6. We basically said to all of our users, if you want to get the update, you have to join on Steam and get it through Steam. So there was no FTP updating. Uh, that was a struggle in the environment because they basically crashed us <laughs> with about 1.5 million users trying to get the content all at once. And like, so that was, there were some learning lessons there. Um, in 2004, you know, obviously we started increasing the size of the network, got, got things straightened out, and we released Half-Life 2. Now, Steam at that time was a team of about eight people that were building this out, and we were looking at the infrastructure for doing content delivery. And because we were a bunch of embedded engineers, uh, we chose Windows as our platform for doing delivery for the server bases. And we actually chose uh, TCP as the connection stream. And, like, and so everybody had dedicated TCP sessions where we would open sockets on the servers. Now the nice thing is, as a single one use server at that time, we could put out uh, 10 gigabits of data out of a single server. So that was one of, the four, one of the driving requirements of Steam all along, is to actually, from a hardware point of view, have a very small footprint and, like, and be very mobile in the sense that we could put it into networks around the world um, and get the content close to the users. So this is what we were trying to accomplish back when we launched in 2004, and, and we were successful. We had actually a very successful Half-Life 2 launch. 2005, we actually, launch third-party games and like and in that case we came out with ragdo con rag ragdoll kung fu was the first game that we came out with and and also a ser series of games with strategy first so now we are actually a content delivery network in the sense for gaming not only were we delivering our own content updating content we were actually selling third-party games on top of the steam platform um, with, at that point in time, we also set up the idea that we would do everything we could to make sure that users had the best possible experience they could. So we had a, a pretty major network expansion. We were going to ISPs, um, working with them to put Steam content servers actually within their network. So to a great extent, you think of it over the top right from the start we were in. I actually remember us going out and actually putting in servers in some of the telco facilities for, for broadband, or for telcos here in the United States. We were physically have one server sitting inside their racks running off DC power, believe it or not, um, supporting this environment. Um, in 2011, uh, we actually made a huge switch. This is when we decided that we wanted to have more edge caching. So we switched to HTTP. We switched away from TCP to HTTP. Delivery, we also introduced CDNs to augment 
um, our traffic needs. Um, we are starting to increase pretty rapidly. Keeping up with the, keeping up with the server needs was uh, fairly difficult. And, like, and so then we decided, well, okay, let's flood over into uh, CDNs for additional traffic availability. So pretty big. 2012, we released non-gaming uh, non apps. So we expanded from games into non, uh, just standard desktop type applications. Obviously, these are more focused on gamers, so you're going to get a lot of paintbrush, those kind of things type of applications that actually fit with gamers, some acceleration programs and such. In 2014, actually, we introduced live broadcasting into the Steam client. And we also started, uh, we introduced the concept that users could play music through the client, uh, indies could release their music, and then also movies. So towards the end of the year, we actually released movies on top of the Steam platform. In 2015, uh, late this year, we'll actually release the Steam Box. You probably heard about it a little bit in the industry or in the press. Uh, Steam Box, the controller, a link. What a link is is basically an in-house streaming device to where you can use your PC in your office as your main driving gaming PC. Because obviously, for gaming, a lot of times it's the power of the PC that matters but you want to play in your living room. So you can use a link to hang it off your TV so that you can actually use in-home streaming to play games anywhere, else, anywhere in your house from your main gaming PC. And then obviously, uh, we're in the VR market. We announced a relationship with HTC where they're going to produce the Valve VR goggles. And, like, and, that will, and we will provide VR content on top of Steam. So. Steam a little bit more in depth. Uh, the concept of Steam is that you have personalized web pages that has content to you. It's, we keep track of, you know, like any good site, we keep track of what you're purchasing and we present you with content that you're actually interested in. Uh, you have multiple ways to browse through that content, search through that content. Um, and then obviously the content's more relevant to you what you're looking at here on the screen is actually you're looking at the PC desktop. Well, actually, you're looking at the desktop version of it, which is, which is PC, Linux, and Mac OS. And, like, and then you're looking at the big picture mode, which is the same content just formatted for viewing on your television and using a controller to scroll through, through that content. Um, as Dan mentioned, uh, we have 125 million users. Actually, it's uh, quite a bit higher than that uh, at the moment, but we're not, <laughs> we're not ready to announce the next new number. Uh, 9.5 million concurrent players um, at any one time. Um, we have 2 billion minutes played per day. So there's a lot of gaming going, out to, going on out there worldwide. And 4,500 pieces of content Content ranges from 100 megabytes all the way up to uh, GTA 5, just released here two weeks ago, and it's actually 60 gigabytes. So it's fairly large content. The map that you see on the right hand side is actually a heat map of downloads over a 48 hour period. And as you can see, you can see the traffic move around the world in this, in this format. So, in addition to that, we've added economy and trading. So one of the things that's key about Steam and key about our users is we highly believe that if you put the tools in people's hands to make content and you give them a place to push that content out, they will start generating it. And, like, and we've shown that uh, with the economy and trading. People can make items for several games on top of Steam. Um, the simplest example is hats for TF. We, we joke about hats for, our, for one of our games called Team Fortress. Um, but as an individual person, you can make a hat at home and you can upload it into Steam and you can put it up for sale through our workshop or you can trade it. So you can trade items that you own from within the games between users and like. And so this is creating an economy inside of Steam and like so, and you can use the funds from that economy to actually purchase games, to purchase other games, 
or to trade somebody else for another item. So we totally believe that the community in, as a whole should actually be producing content, uploading that content into Steam, and then that content's downloaded to the users that are interested in it. And we're gonna keep continuing pushing on this. So we're not talking about producing content from individual companies or game companies anymore and just being the traditional one direction. We've actually created a platform that is two directions. And like, so it's as important to us how fast, how easy it is for people to upload content, it is for us to push content out to them. And like, so this is a major component of Steve. And as you can see, uh, 2.3 uh, billion items traded since its inception. inception. Um, currently, we have 5.5 million items traded. From the content generation point of view, Valve has already paid out from the start of workshop, people putting content in $53 million to, third, to individuals producing content for the platform. And like, so it's, so it's hugely important in that sense. So we're, we're not just a content delivery platform, we're, a, we're an economical platform too, or we're in a growing ecosystem, as I should say. Uh, this is what it, this is Steam, excuse me. This is Steam uh, by region, and like as you can see, Europe and North America, Western Europe and North America make up the largest component of, of this, um, with the rest of the world growing fairly quickly. Russia there at eight percent. Um, it's kind of funny. One of the things that I wanted to mention about this chart: this is this chart's ending the end of 2014. The interesting thing is, is if you go back two years, at the end of 2012. North America and Europe made up 87% of the overall chart. And like, so as you can see for us, other parts of the world, specifically Southeast Asia, Russia, um, and actually China are growing at a pretty significant rate and eating up the overall market, eating, creating a larger market share for themselves in the content space. Um, so, Obviously, one of the things I needed, to, one of my purposes was actually to talk about what we ended up doing for a network. So Valve strategy is really twofold. Um, we have our own content servers that we distribute around the world. But then in addition to that, as I said, we augment with traditional CDNs. We currently actually use uh, six different CDNs. Uh, a lot of the choices on CDNs or geographic distribution is probably the most, most important thing for us. Um, some of the points of presence we actually do ourselves because the CDNs actually don't reach there very well. So we needed to reach there. Um, so this basically is showing you that we actually have points of presence for content delivery inside of 52 cities, uh, two, uh, 260 plus servers spread out. Um, our latest generation of a server, it's kind of funny. Um, one of the things we, I always talk about content delivery, and obviously CDNs have the issue of they have to be able to deliver lots of different types of content. We're able to deliver very specific content. And, like, and so in that sense, we're able to create a very customized content delivery network because we have a client also on each person's PC. So Steam is a client that's on everybody's desktop. And like, and so we're able to, to basically build a server. We have a 2U server that we build um, that actually can deliver 40 gigabits. It operates at, on, on a really busy day, it will operate at about 38 gig. And like, um, obviously at some point in time, it'd be cool if we could push that to 100 gig. But what this does is this allows us to have a very inexpensive, low cost hardware platform for delivering, basically, here we have about 2.5 terabits of total capacity available to us. Now, obviously, we find there's days that we burst the three, four terabits per second. And like the rest of that's what's flowing over onto the CDNs. So for us, from a cost point of view, the strategy of having a mixed solution has always been super valuable. And like, in the sense that we can have a very customized solution for, our, for content for most of the time, and then we, when we really need to be able to burst beyond 
um, we have the CDNs. Now, the CDNs will actually tell you valve doesn't necessarily burst really spiky. Um, there are days where we'll really have a steep curve, but to a great extent, a burst for us is something that lasts a month long. And like, we'll do a winter sale or we'll do a summer sale or something like that. And the system will literally run at four terabits for a month. So that's, that's what we consider a burst. And like, so, uh, whoop, I guess I'm running low on power. Um, on top of that, uh, this is our backbone and our, and our pops laid together. The red dots are actually our major locations. Typically, these will be able to deliver about 500 uh, gigabits of content. But the major thing, because we're a gaming company, we also run servers, run gaming servers. So a lot of these locations are for, our, are for gaming servers too. Uh, we, have, we have all of these locations, most of them. We support concurrent users of about 2 million players on top of game servers. So we ended up building this structure now. But the nice thing is, is by having the backbone, the backbone ranges anywhere from 10 gig to 40 gig, depending on what location it is. Um, we're able to move content like the live broadcast stuff. We're able to move, move content across our own network where one person with live broadcasting, a person's able to upload. You're able to basically watch an individual. Whoop, did I, ooh, and I just lost my computer. I'll keep going, don't worry about it. I'll keep going, don't worry about it. I can, there's, there's two more slides and I can, I can talk through them. Sorry about that, Dan. <laughs> um, so in live broadcasts, what we decided to do is we decided to add a feature to where I'm sitting there playing my video game and my buddy wants to watch me. And like, and he can literally click on a button and ask me if he can watch and I, or I can sit there and say that anybody can watch and they can start watching me play my video game. This is uh, a pretty common, um, pretty common format in the sense that People like to watch other people play video games. And like, it's, it's just, remember back to the days when I would actually remember back to the days where I'd actually stand over the shoulder of my buddy and watch him play video games. Well, what we've done is we've extracted that and virtualized that out to the PC space. So now you can watch video games. So we need to be able to move that traffic because now what happens is a person playing a game or a team playing a game in China wants to be viewed by somebody playing in that wants to be viewed by somebody in Germany. So we have to transit that live broadcast traffic across. It can be one to one, it can be one to two, or it can be one to many, and like however you want to do. So this is one of the newest applications in the gaming space. Now we can think about this. Twitch does some does the same thing. And like I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Twitch. We've just built it into the client so it's a one touch click and go. Uh, we expect that in August we will have the international for Dota 2, which is a huge broadcasting. We'll probably set, we're expecting to set new records for the number of people viewing. The prize pool will be somewhere around $15 million um, is where we're, we're, where we're targeting. It sits today, um, based upon the compendium, it sits today at about $8 million. So it's one of the largest video game pools for winners. Uh, it's an event in Seattle. Uh, going forward, for us, going forward, the key things that we're concerned about, and the reason, one of the main reasons why we have a mixed network, why we use our own network for CDN and, and also use CDNs, is denial of services tax as we're going forward. And like, and we decided, and we found that we're attacked so often, we fend off, no kidding, we fend off on average probably four denial of service attacks a day. Most common attack is one individual attacking another individual on a game server. Obviously, if you're running clusters, if you can take down one server in a cluster, odds are you'll take down the entire cluster. So we found that looking at solutions out there, we needed an always on, demand solution and so this ended up resulting in us building our own system and like other things that why we have systems like this is we see content in the gaming space growing I don't think we see this in a lot of other spaces GTA 5 which released here a couple weeks ago was 60 gig we're expecting uh, by the end of the year to actually see a hundred gig game 
So we're talking about seriously large content going out to individuals. So that was the, so that's one of the main things that we think about in our overall force. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is we're always tracking stats. We actually make this available for our users um, online at steampower.com statistics. You can go and look at all of the traffic statistics for the different ISPs, for our overall network telling you what you're delivering uh, to users and uh, the download rates for each one of the countries and how much content we're delivering to all the countries is always available online. I wish I had the nice graph that showed, <laughs> showed that. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time. Are there any questions? No, yeah, right here in front. You mentioned you started development on Windows. Is that still in place? Uh, yes, actually, you know, obviously we use uh, we use Linux for a lot of our servers. We use Linux for a lot of our caching servers and things like that. But Windows is still the form, the base format for the content delivery servers. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you talk about how you distribute the application logic to the edge of the network as well as the, the content? So I would imagine for a game, there's a lot of sort of low latency application logic that has to happen near the users. Uh, yeah. So he's asking, can I describe the application uh, logic for delivering to the for delivering to the edge for the users? A lot of it. Uh, so to, uh, yes, latency for the initial. Con Latency is super important for the initial communication. The, game, the individual clients will talk, to, will talk to what we call a content directory server. The content directory server basically then communicates, communicates with our home system and it has a file list of all of the available points of presence for content delivery. Um, it will then obviously issue a ticket to the client saying you have access rights to XYZ locations. And then the clients will actually communicate with those locations and start downloading content. We allow, from a logic point of view, we allow for connection to multiple individual locations at one time to receive the content. We want to deliver the content as fast as we can. Latency doesn't matter to us once the content's being delivered, once we're in the flow. Um, so latency really, we don't care. So what we want to do is fill up the user's pipe, though. And we want to use as much of it as possible without taking away from their experience. So, and then the content is delivered basically in 100 kilobyte bytes. And, like, and then basically the client has a logic in it to put it all back together and decode it or decrypt it and then create a con then basically create a content depot on the user, individual user's PC. Is that answer your question? Well, anybody else? Here we go. No, we actually don't consider peer to peer. We actually investigated peer to peer technologies very early on. Um, back in 2010, we were thinking that, okay, there's got to be a much faster way to deliver this, and peer to peer had to be it. And, like, and so we started investigating heavily in peer-to-peer. -peer. And what we ended up finding is that you couldn't seed enough locations to actually create peer-to-peer. -peer. And, like, and so we basically abandoned that. In, over here. Uh, you mentioned it's, it's, uh, concurrency about nine and a half million sessions. Uh-huh. Uh, no, uh, th no, because to a great extent, the number of concurrents are people that potentially are playing games. So it's not, uh, it's not the download rate. So it's only a portion of those users would actually be downloading from us. Some of those users are actually just playing the game, right? For most video games, this is, a, this is going to be an average across India. For most multiplayer video games, it's about 120 kilobytes per game. And like, so we kind of separate out. We have our bandwidth for our content distribution system, and like, which is the available bandwidth of it for that is about 2.5 to 3 terabits per second. But then on top of that, we're actually doing probably about 2 gigabytes of actual game server traffic 
too. So it's kind of a mix. So you can't take all of those and divide it down and go, this is all the people dividing. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm sorry my computer died. <laughs> I'm like, I guess I should have brought the power supply. Thanks.